Hello everyone and welcome to this mini lecture on Frances Ellen Watkins Harper uh, and her poetry. So Harper was an author, writer, uh, activist and lived from 1825 to 1911. So she lived almost 90 years um, or I think 86 if I can do the math right. Uh, not bad for a person from the 1800s to live 86 years. Uh, she was born to free parents, uh, however, she was orphaned at an early age, and so while she herself never became a slave, I w one would have to imagine that being orphaned at a young age as a person of African descent, there was a lot of parallels in her experience with those of um, people born into slavery. Throughout her life, she was, a, I guess the best way to sum, sum up her life was as an activist. Uh, she worked on abolition, she worked on black education, temperance, which is another word for um, ending, uh, ending alcohol, and anti-lynching campaigns. So she, very rich life of continually trying to end injustice in various ways, particularly around education, abolition, and lynching, um, and really kind of driven through spiritual beliefs um, in the belief of equality and all this, particularly around temperance. A lot of the temperance movement was spiritually derived um, it, within this country, that there was a strong Christian movement to uh, end drinking in the country. So, we're taking a look at her poetry, but she didn't just write poetry, she wrote a lot of different writings from essays to um, stories to poems, and so much of it was focused on these issues of injustice in the culture. And here we have, you know, this woman who, again, within 1800s would be largely seen as a, as a person without statue. Uh, without stature, with the, a person that, you know, as a African American female, should not hold any kind of power, or is largely discriminated against to hold power, and yet did a lot with, despite that, to really push these various movements that she was involved in. So we're going to take a look at the poem, "The Slave Mother." Heard you that shriek? It rose so wildly on the air, it seemed as if a burdened heart was breaking in despair. Saw you those hands so sadly clasp, the bowed and feeble hand, the shuddering of that fragile form, that look of grief and dread? Saw you the sad imploring eye, its every glance was pain, as if a storm of agony were sweeping through the brain. So. We have here a very, very simple poem, at least on it, you know, laid out, right? Have you, did you hear that shriek? It rose wildly in the air, um, it seemed, right? So here we move into the, uh, the analogy portion of the poem, as if a burdened heart was breaking despair. You saw those hands that were sadly clasped, the bowed and feeble hand, the shuddering of that fragile form, that look of grief and dread, saw you the sad imploring eye. Its every glance was pain, as if a storm of agony were sweeping through the brain. Now, if we take out the title of this poem, you know, this sounds like just something extremely sad and disheartening that we hear the shriek, and from it, you know, what we hear, we see what we hear, and we derive these, these views from it, this, what we think it might be, right? A burdened heart breaking in despair. And then we move on to sight, and, you know, saw you those hands so sadly clasped, the bowed and feeble hand, then the shuddering, the, the shuddering of that fragile form. So we move from hearing to actually seeing. And with that seeing, we also look into this person's eyes, right? And of course, the eyes are, we're told, hold so much of the person, hold so much of their identity. And in this case, you know, its every glance was pain, as if a storm of agony were sweeping through the brain. So we get this very, very interesting image of a person in agony with a burdened heart, breaking in despair. I mean, look, look at all of those, you know, a shuddering of that fragile form, grief and dread, and sad, imploring eyes. All this language around the body 
and it's the ways in which it, it is struck asunder. And what we, if we take, if we didn't know that, if we didn't know that the poem's title, you know, we would we would all say, oh my, you know, what's going on? What what's wrong with this person? But of course, when we get that title, the slave mother, it changes a couple things. First of all, it makes us recognize the humanity in slave mothers, and this has this is important again within during um, during slavery the ways in which humans were seen as non-humans, right? Slave mothers were seen as not real mothers, right? And when we use real in that context, we often meant um, you know not white mothers, not middle class or upper class mothers. So we have the slave mother who's experiencing all these crazy things, but we do not. We culturally, they're denied that. Culturally, they're seen as irrelevant, because we understand that when we hear that title, the slave mother, associated with the rest of this poem, what is that burdened heart, right? What is that that storm of agony sweeping through the brain for the slave mother? Well, it's the child that's been taken away from her. It's the ways in which she will never get to be the mother that so many of the readers of this poem understand and experience motherhood or experience their mother. And so in a very, very, you know, small set of words, we have Harper really trying to flip the our or flip readers' perceptions of that slave mother, rather than this this removed, emotionless, or not even worthy of, you know, worthy of our respect. She takes the time to really paint that picture differently for us. All right, so that's the introduction to the slave mother. Um, certainly, take a you know, we're going to be reading other works of hers. You know, try to look for the ways in which Harper is really trying to get into that that other view, really trying to humanize that which culture has dehumanized. Thank you very much for listening, and see you in the next video.